unsupervised learning. K means an hierarchical clustering. In this video, we'll look at unsupervised learning, clustering, centroid model, clustering, such as k-means, clustering performance, evaluation metrics, hierarchical clustering with algorithmic clustering. Let's get started. Unsupervised learning looks for previously undetected patterns in a dataset with no pre-existing labels, with a minimum of human supervision, also known as self-organization, and allows for modeling of probability densities of inputs. In this example, we have no target labels. We only have the training examples, x. So we often want to do dimensionality reduction on the input feature vectors or clustering to find clusters of similar samples. A central theme of unsupervised learning is a field of density estimation in statistics where we intend to infer a prior probability distribution for x, px. We'll look at clustering it to begin with. So this is the task of grouping a set of objects in such a way, the objects in the same group called a cluster are more similar in some sense to then those in other groups, clusters. Itself is not a specific algorithm, but a general task to be solved and can be achieved by various algorithms that differ significantly in the understanding of what constitutes a cluster and how to efficiently find them. Popular notions of clusters include groups with small distances between cluster members, dense areas of the data space, intervals, or particular statistical distributions. Module of sklearn cluster, each clustering algorithm comes with scikit-learn's fit and predict methods. The notion of what forms a cluster varies, hence there are different algorithms of the form. So we have centroid models, k-means represents each cluster by a single mean vector, connectivity models, hierarchical clustering such as agglomerative clustering, builds models on distance connectivity, birch, affinity, propagation, based on the concept of message parsing between data points, distribution models, clusters are modeled using statistical distributions such as Gaussian mixtures, and density models such as DB scan optics, mean shift defines clusters as connected dense regions in the data space. So begin with the one of the first clustering methods is k-means, which is a centroid model clustering. And this actually clusters data by trying to separate the samples in n groups equal variance, minimizing a criterion known as the inertia or within cluster sum of squares. This algorithm requires a number of clusters to be specified in advance, normally k. It scales well to a large number of samples and has been used across a large range of application areas in many fields. It works by taking the set of samples where there's n and actually dividing them into k disjoint clusters, each described with its own mean vector mu. Now the means are commonly called the cluster centroids. They are not in general points from the actual samples and they live in the same space. Now the algorithm chooses to the centroids to minimize the inertia or within cluster sum of squares criterion with the following formula. The inertia can be recognized as a measure of how internally coherent clusters are. It suffers from some various drawbacks though. So inertia makes the assumption that clusters are convex and isotropic, which is not always the case. It responds poorly to elongated clusters or manifolds with irregular shapes. Inertia is a not a normalized metric. We just know that lower values are better and zero is optimal. But in very high dimensional spaces, Euclidean distances tend to become inflated. This is an instance of the so-called curse of dimensionality. Running a dimensionality reduction algorithm such as principal component analysis prior to k-means clustering can help alleviate this problem and speed up computations. Now, the, one of the original implementations of k-means was Lloyd's algorithm. And you can see a quick animation here where it iterates to find the centroid or clusters of the means. However, there is a scikit-learn optimization to speed up searching through the iterations, which is initialization k means plus plus. And this actually initializes centroids to instead just be selectively random samples to actually be distanced from each other, leading to provably better results than random initialization. It also supports sample weights, and we have an input parameter k. So we have to actually choose k in advance. However, we can actually work out k, but there's extra steps involved. And we normally need to use a information criterion method such as the elbow method to look at the percentage of variance explained as a function of the number of clusters. So we can import the k-means from the cluster module from scikit-learn. And I have a very simple animation that will just visualize this. So say we had a data set 
of three different classes and we'll just iterate this. So this is obviously iteration one, two, three, and you see they eventually iterate over and find them. However, if we set k to an inaccurate value like k equals four and ran it again, you would see that uh, it would actually try and fit four classes to the data set and actually some of the data set was incorrectly classified. So mini batch k-means is a optimization on the k-means algorithm to reduce the computational time while still trying to maintain the same objective function. So instead of computing the means on the whole data set, it actually batches them up iteratively. So this can work very well in large data sets. And we can get it from the k-means or mini batch from the cluster method as well. And we use it the same way we would. Again, we can use the initialization parameter the batch size in this case, and again, also some other parameters. So you can see actually, in theory, it should be quicker than k-means. However, it does suffer from obviously some accuracy compared to k-means. So getting into how do we actually look at evaluation metrics? So what makes a good cluster? So evaluation or validation of clustering results is as difficult as clustering itself. Popular approaches involve internal evaluation, where the clustering is summarized to a single quality score, or external evaluation, where the clustering is compared to an existing ground truth classification, manual evaluation by a human expert, and or indirect evaluation by evaluating a utility of the clustering in its intended application. Most often than not, we have to use internal metrics as it's quite rare to have external, almost labeled data for us when we're doing unsupervised learning. So if we look at our internal metrics, one of the most popular ones that we'll be using is the silhouette coefficient. And the silhouette coefficient is a value B of measure of how similar an object is to its own cluster, cohesion, compared to other clusters separation. And we're trying to maximize this metric. And it values between the range of negative one and positive one. And we can get it from scikit-learn metrics silhouette score, where you put X and the labels in. Now, generally the higher for convex clusters than other concepts of clusters, such as density-based clusters like those obtained through DB scan. And scores around zero indicate overlapping clusters, and a score is higher when clusters are dense and well separated. We also have other metrics, such as for external evaluation, where we have a labeled ground truth we can use. And if we have something like that, the best metric I recommend to use is the adjusted mutual information score or metric, which is a measure of how much information is shared between clustering in a ground truth classification, which is normalized against chance. And again, we can get it from the metrics adjusted mutual information score, where we put the labels true and labels predict. And labels here is actually from the predict from the output classifier. There's also other ones as well. You can go through the notebook. So let's get onto connectivity model clustering. Hierarchical clustering is a general family of clustering algorithms that builds nested clusters by merging or splitting them successively. This hierarchy of clusters is represented as a tree or dendrogram. The root of the tree is the unique cluster that gathers all the samples and the leaves being the clusters with only one sample. So how this works, we have a dendrogram here on the zoo data set where each sample is a particular animal and we can actually cluster them with this dendrogram here. Now the ability with this dendrogram, it actually links each one together of pairs based on some sort of distance metric. And based on the distance metric we define, we can actually cut this dendrogram at various distance levels or thresholds. So if we cut it here on about 0.8, we will get two clusters. And if we cut it near 0.2, we will get many clusters. And this is a really useful way we can visualize this from our data set and try and infer this. So I've done this in industry with uh, large natural language processing tasks. We have many different responses in instance, and we can actually see the clustering, how they form. So aggregative clustering is an object that performs hierarchical clustering using a bottom-up approach. Each observation starts in its own cluster and pairs of clusters are merged as one moves up the hierarchy. The linkage criteria determines the metric used for the merge strategy. So single linkage is by default minimizes distance between the closest observation of pairs of clusters. However, the most common in practice to use is ward, which minimizes the sum of squared differences within all clusters. It's a variance minimization approach, and in this sense, it is similar to k-means objective function, but tackled with the aggregative hierarchical approach. 
It can also be used to scale a large number of samples when it's used also with a connectivity matrix, as we'll see down below. So if we look at particular dendrogram, and we can see this with aggregative clustering model, and we can also import from SciPy, this time, dendrogram and the F cluster. So we can load the iris data set and load our classifier like so, and then we can train it. Now we can then also use, say, SciPy plotting functionality to plot the dendrogram and also to cut the cluster. So here we have a hierarchical clustering dendrogram, and if we wanted to cut it at, say, 9, we would actually end up with three clusters. And when we print out the labels for these clusters, this is what we see here. And we can now put the labels with by doing dot predict as well, or the F cluster method. So we can also look at using, in this case, a single linkage, average linkage, complete linkage, and ward linkage against each other. So you see that single linkage seems to be good to initially, but actually ward linkage is the best used in practice, especially when we have mixed data set combined and also individual clusters as well, such like this. So you can read this description here as well. So we can also add connectivity constraints between the clusters. If say we believe that there were such things in our space, we can add this in with uh, a k means. So obviously we have algorithmic clustering again. And this time we actually create a k neighbors or k neighbors graph, which is a connectivity graph, which we can pass into the algorithmic clustering model. So this is illustrated here. So we have a Swiss roll structure and without connectivity constraints, it's actually clustered these points together. However, if we do add a connectivity strain, it actually make clusters that form on this particular manifold of the Swiss roll. In summary, we've covered centroid models, k-means, clustering performance, valuation metrics, and hierarchical clustering with algorithmic clustering.